Thank you for joining us today for Coffee Chats. Um, we are honored to have the amazing Deborah Roberts with us today. I think everyone here knows what great work she does, how accomplished she is, and how her work is collected um, by major impressive institutions across the globe. Um, so I won't bother with a long introduction, um, except to say that I'm very excited to see Deborah's upcoming exhibition at the Contemporary. And we also have the also amazing Bethlehem McConan with us. She'll be in conversation with Deborah for today's coffee chat. And Betty is the most recent recipient of the Tito's Prize and her prescient solo exhibition is still currently in stasis in the big medium gallery. Um, we will have a chance for questions towards the end of the talk around 1145. And if you have questions, will you please use the chat feature and thank you so much to Deborah and Betty. Um, I very much look forward to y'all's conversation and I will hand it over to you both if y'all wanna. Thank you. Hey, hey. Hey, good morning. <laughs> good morning, how are you? I'm good. Um, hello, everyone. We can't see you, but we know you are there. Um, how's it going? How are you, Deb? I'm good. I'm good. You know, I, um, I'm just doing what everybody else is doing, trying to survive the, uh, the uh, corona, you know, running from corona like everyone else. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm still doing my work. I'm happy to say I finished all my collaging uh, and uh, all the shift screening. So I'm just, you know, starting on the installation part of, of my show at uh, the Contemporary. So uh, I'm really happy about that. You know, we made it, we made it. We, my assistants were so good and um, helping me get the work finished. And I'm just really thankful for that. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I think you're, that's exactly what I was thinking about asking you is, you know, you were already in preparation for the show that's coming up now in 2021, since it was delayed due to all this craziness that we are all experiencing. But yeah, I think it would be great for you maybe to share with us just uh, the disruption, you know, the change in what you had already planned, the adjustments that you had to make in right. preparation for this show due to this unprecedented, unforeseen uh, reality that we all are living in right now. Right. Well, the show originally was uh, slated to open in September um you know which was going to be great because this was the only show i was doing this year so thank god i only planned that i only planned one show um i, I felt like it was for me because this is my hometown that uh doing a contemporary show uh was a very personal act and so i remember thinking i didn't really want anything else you know circling around you know at least you know, because it's right at the end and almost in the middle of the year. So it's really hard to plan stuff, uh, maybe Basel later. But um, I wanted to really like throw the kitchen sink at this show. Um, I don't know why, but you know, I, I did. And um, because I have nothing to prove. Um, but um, I, I think with the break, it has allowed um, a lot of more something different to happen with the work, which I am really happy about. Um, and, you know, just more time to think about it. Um, you know, we still having issues with um, Black Lives Matter um, protests and people still dying um, with police uh, brutality so, and misconduct. So that hadn't changed, but I kind of was able to push a little bit more of that and well into the work um uh, for this show then i i didn't plan on doing it you know i was going to talk about the body what it's like to be in a black person's body and things like that but um this new movement I, and i call it the new movement it's because we're no longer carrying these signs by ourselves 
you know, it's more inclusive. It's as um, uh, Tony Morrison said, I mean, leave me out of it. It's time for someone else to start, you know, moving it, move the dialogue, move the needle. So, um, so I think that helped with me with the work. So, yeah, this time, this time is really good for me. Interesting. I mean, I can imagine just the lack of distraction and focus that it gave you. And I'm sure there was solace too in just putting everything into the work, right? A sense of focus and groundingness that it gave you in this time when we all felt unmoored and kind of thrown at sea. Right, um, right. So, yeah. And, uh, I, and it's interesting that you said that there was uh, a direct response that you felt, right, to address into the work, even though, of course, the work was already in the making, right? So right, do you want right. to just, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? I'd be interested to know. Right, well, you know, I, I tell people all the time that I couch my argument in uh, contemporary work by using children to talk about race, beauty, um, gender, and all those things. So it's really hard to use that type of physical, you know, body in in relationship to violence and and people, um, you know, displacing them and and seeing them as invisible. So I really had to think about how I was going to do that. What was the best way to talk about uh, looting and rioting and peaceful protesting and being black and being seen but not seen and things like that using children. And so I really, really had to think about that, do a lot of reading. And I figured out a couple of ways that you will see in the work that they're very subtle ways. They're not in your face. You're going to have to see why is this kid doing this? And why is this place and this work? Uh, and, it's, and it's talking about that. Um, you know, why can, when Black people peacefully protest and some people start to loot and riot because of the anger and the frustration that has been building and building, it explodes and they're seen as animals and creatures. Why is that? And, and why they're not frustrated people because they're tired of hitting their head up against the wall and getting nothing out of it, turning the other cheek over and over and over. So how could I do that in my work that still wasn't preachy? That, that still brings, yet bring the audience to the work and hopefully um, they can unpack the, these messages and they're not lost on it. And so that was, um, that was unique. It was a hard thing to do, but I, I, I figured that I changed some of the colors in my work. I went darker. I, 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 I still have a lot of patterns and stuff like that, but um, just lots, several different things changed in the work. And I don't want to give it away because I, I definitely want people to come to the show, but um, you're going to definitely see, you know, three major strikes in my work that has changed from all the work that's been, uh, that I show on Instagram. Um, and hopefully um, it can engage you in a way that, you know, um, that people, you know, want to see from me, you know, still, this is my activism and I can be subtle or I can be in your face right now. I'm trying to be subtle, but if it's not getting through, it's going to start becoming in your face a little bit more. Um, you know, I think it's interesting uh, what you said, because for me, everything that you've talked about has always been present in the work, you know, right. in the sense mm -hmm. that you, you have a, and we've talked actually personally a little bit about this ourselves just in the studio of, you know, the things that are happening right now are timeless, not timely, right? right. It's not yeah. anything new. Mm -hmm. It is not uh, uh, some phenomenon that is happening right now. It is right. just uh, uh, a recognition and a visibility of what has existed in this country since its, its right. inception, right? right. So, I mean, for me, uh, the works, you know, the collage works from the beginning are addressing this, right? And uh, I think for me, something that struck me like a, 
maybe like a whole new fold, like in uh, engaging with your work, I was thinking about like the use of children, you know, uh, those are the subjects, right, of your work. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about like, what is different to what is happening right now, to what we witnessed with the rebellions that started in May. Uh, and its connection to hope or a different future. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh my goodness, I mean, those children actually, to me, now more than ever, symbolize hope. Right. That you are, right. you know, you are dealing with the history, the present, but because of who the subject is, hope. Mm -hmm. So, I'm curious um, to hear, and these are conversations I've been having with lots of people in this time, is your relationship to hope and, you know, how was it affected or not affected or, you know, with what just currently happened and what we're going through right now? Right. Well, you know, of course I have plenty of hope. You know, when you use kids as, as the main, um, you know, mm -hmm subject in your work there's always a chance of hope you know because they can change the world each new generation can change the world so that is always present in the work i hope that people can see that um i think what has happened in my work is that er earlier than we maybe think of kids are taking control of their lives and how people see them, how they view them, how they walk in the world. Uh, some old stereotypes need to be dismantled in order for them to be a little bit more freer. So that is a hope that I hope that people see in the work. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's in my, even at my age, I still have hope that things were gonna change. Uh, but I, I feel, again, as Tony Morrison said, this is not, leave me out of it. It's time to dismantle white supremacy and, and how can black people help others dismantle? Not, you know, cause we've been doing it, trying to do it for the last 40, 50 years and it's just not working. Um, and we need allies to come in, not to speak for us to, but to support us and speak up when things, you know, go wrong. So yeah, I hope that's hoping to work. I have a little hope, a little, just a little, a little. <laughs> <laughs> little, not in my lifetime, but maybe you know yeah i think uh you know even for myself in this in this period of just deep self-reflection without the distraction uh i realize just how important it is to hold on to hope and to not allow anything to take it away right. and that uh hope is in the history of resistance. It has fueled resistance, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, yeah, whatever uh, systemic injustice, white supremacy, uh, it's too precious to allow that to be taken away. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and also just th the history of that connection to hope, to me, you know, when I think about the collage works, you know, there, the collapsing of all these different uh, bodies, like you're creating right. bodies out of several bodies. So, uh, you know, there is a geography, a mapping, uh, almost like an archive, the body becomes an archive, you know, right. you have mm -hmm. Baldwin's fist, uh, you know, uh, and then, like you said, you have Morrison's mouse. It's as if, um, everything you need, who you are, uh, your visibility, your existence is, uh, is in you already. And here it is collapsed across time, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I, it's just incredibly effective, you know, serving as the body as an archive, the body as a geography, the body as history. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And, uh, I mean, I'm curious because I mean, my own practice is obsessed with time. How are you thinking about time in relationship to these bodies that you create? 
Right. Well, you know, this idea that we're all beneficiaries of people who have came before us and people who are, you know, alive with us. So I'm using these Michaelas as artifacts of this time that I'm gathering from Black history, American history, art history, pop culture, and adding all these types of things to the work and building, constructing a new identity uh, with these images and these people. And, and hopefully, when people look back on my work, they'll see, okay, she was talking about this. What, I mean, what is hate? You know, what is, what is colorism? I mean, I mean, we don't understand that. I mean, so having the work become archive of this time is very important to me. And, but also archive uh, an artifact of history, you know? So yeah, you're gonna see Baldwin. If you listen to it, read Baldwin right now, you would think he was alive writing for today, now, at this time. I mean, um, the bell hooks, um, you know, listen to Nina Simone talk about what is the job of an artist. You know, all those things are very real and present. And they were said 40, 50 years ago, you know. So, so that's important to me, that people see the, the complexity of the work and what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, you know, I talked to a couple of my friends and, and we talk about, you know, and, and I worry about this. I had some curator tell me, stop worrying. But, you know, whether the work was too pretty, you know, I, I worry about that. I don't want to work, make my children disfigured too much because I think people think, and this is a, a, a broad statement, but I, I tend to think they think black kids are ugly in the way that they are approached and way they are treated and they'll think of them as less innocent and that they can take a lot of punishment. And so it's important that there's a human element to the work, even though the, the, the features may be exaggerated and, and larger, there is an innocence and beauty within that work. And, and if you just look at, you know, some of the, you know, a square, you'll see a beautiful little kid that exists in this, this joined body. And, and, and that's what I try to tell people, and this sounds a little Pollyanna, is that, you know, I want you to search for that humanity because once you see someone as human and vulnerable, it's, it's to me, as a human, it's impossible to mistreat them constantly mistreat them. Um, so that's, that's, you know, the basis of the work. So, yeah, I mean, I want my kids to, um, in the work to really be strong, be powerful, but also be vulnerable and, and that people want to take care of them and, and see them as not acting out, but trying to find your own voice, not being loud and destructive but being assert, I mean, uh, um, assertive, you know, not aggressive, you know, those type of terminology that tend to, to stereotype young black girls and black women. And it's really standing up for your own rights, you know, things like that. So all of that is at play in the work, um, you know, hence the big red gloves early on, um, the, the, the eye that stares you directly in the face to make eye contact with you, not to look away or to look down, things like this, those little things that you see forever in my work, um, which, you know, uh, I, I, I always say that's me, that's me in my work when I know there's some people who, um, um, you know, make different types of collage faces and for me, uh, having a white background and having the eye to directly look at you and your face, that's significantly my work. So I thought that was really important, um, you know, when I'm talking about uh, people pay, looking under this white gaze of, of blackness, is that you look at me, but I'm looking directly at you. Um, and so, yeah. And don't get me started talking about my work now. I'll be talking all day. That's what people <laughs> want to know about. <laughs> I, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it, um, I was uh, looking through, I think it was in the catalog, uh, the Spelman Museum catalog for the evolution of Mimi, which is an amazing catalog and raises the bar super high, you know, thinking about the contemporary coming up. Uh, but, 
<laughs> no an shade. incredible, incredible, incredible uh, catalog uh, in terms of the commission writing and just as an object, as an archive of your work. Um, but uh, there is uh, an, like it, it talks about your your you know collage as a radical verb, right? And right. Uh, uh, that you know touches upon the fact that you know, like you said, uh, these you're not trying to create a representation, a, a totem, or a monolith. You know, you're trying to convey this uh, complexity of what identity, personhood is the in-betweenness, the contradictions, the uh, what it means to be human. You are not trying to respond one-to-one -one against something, right? You're, you're right. trying to pull out of the orbit of white supremacy and its ideas of what like a human is, like they're registering or trademarking of a human, right? Right. right. Uh, so, uh, so for me, you know, I think that the, just that is where you have the, the use of these different figures, these uh, different touch points uh, mm -hmm. of different times, uh, of different approaches, but all for the, uh, a f in a fight against, uh, um, in a struggle towards liberation, liberation right. of black bodies, right? right? Of black bodies in space, black mm -hmm. bodies in life. Uh, and I, you know, I mean, that is uh, done so successfully in such a, 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 a distilled manner, like you said, but again, with, with poetry and unexpected, uh, um, uh, unexpected ways of affecting you. Like you said, it's not uh, didactic, it's not presentational. Uh, the fact it's also children. Uh, it does it in a very poetic and personal radical language. Um, well, and, you know, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, you. No, I was just gonna say, just add to that, you know, um, collage has always been a, 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 a tool to gain agency in the world. It's a political tool. It was used in the days of Dadaism with Hannah exactly. Hope and all those yes. the women when she was talking about Picasso going off to Africa and taking these, these sculptures and, and, the, and the shape of black women's bodies and, and using them in his work and, and being held as, you know, this great genius. And, and she used the body, the black body uh, and mask and things like that to, to, to show that you know this has a history and it's not a western idea of, of beauty it's a, its own history so yeah i i think collage is very important in, in, in gaining political agency in the world to 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 uh amplify their problems that exist and this collage is a way a vehicle in order to talk about it and you know you know what i used to do uh we talk about the, the type of painting that i used to i used to work with and and uh, the romanticism of that work. And, it's, and, it's, and there's nothing wrong with that work. I mean, like I always tell people, the work was changing. I had nothing to do with it. I allowed it to happen. The same thing that is happening now. And it's not new. It's not something I created. But I do let the work move me. I mean, I mean if I don't sell another work right now, I'll be OK. And I, I honestly mean that because I think I've done what I wanted to do with the work. I needed the work to say a certain thing. I needed it to help um, bring a story to, to the forefront. You know, I, I needed it to, to secure me. I needed it to do a lot and it has. So, so me right now doing work is the type of work I wanna do. I'm not doing work for my galleries and for people who wanna purchase it. It's the work, it's the language that needs to come out. When you see a nine-year-old girl with a peace sign and a bunch of, you know, animals going across her, I mean, it's just saying that this is not me. You know, this image, this idea of who you think I am doesn't exist. And I don't care if, if anyone gets it or don't get it. It's what I needed to say. The same thing with the collages with George Stenny. I mean, how that worked, I wrestled with that work so Oh my God, with that image, that face, that kid, you know, 
it was it was just you know I, I can't even tell you I mean it, for weeks I I pushed it back and said oh, I don't do regular people I I make up faces and but that work that face would not let me go it said you have to do this and and now look so many more people know about George Stanley Jr. Um, the work is hanging in the National Gallery. It's been collected by five museums. I mean, so I did that job. That, that, was, that was me, you know, using collage as a tool to get this, this guy's story out. And, and I've done that with other works that I'm really proud of. You know, sometimes it's not successful. Sometimes you, you have great ideas. Uh, I.e. my installation coming up. You have <laughs> great ideas and, and whether they come through all the messages that you need to happen, sometimes don't happen. We know that as artists, but we still do our best. We, we continue, continue and continue to push, push beyond what is what people think is successful. And, you know, I hope that when people see my work, they see that type of work ethic that I'm not gonna just um, stand still and just do what I know people want to see. I mean, um, let's see, who was it? Kerry James Marshall, he talked about that years and years ago when he, was, he did a talk at the University of Texas. And I remember listening to that and was like, dude, everybody wants your work. Why would you even think about changing it? And he said, you know, he, ha he, owed, he owed something to the work. It was important you know, whether it's successful or not, to do it, to work it through. And while we're in quarantine, this is the perfect time to do things like that, you know, to try something different, to see if it works. No one's coming into studios. Who wants to come into people's studios right now? Um, and just push the envelope. And uh, I think collage, you know, and that's what I've done. So we'll see if it worked or not, you know, but I had to do it. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, it wasn't a choice, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't push that stuff down. I let it out. I mean, I go ahead and I, I work really hard at it and, and she sometimes it's successful, sometimes it isn't. And I'm okay with that. You know, the motivation is coming or the drive or uh, yeah. the need is coming from inside. Right. right. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, this is great because it's the question I wanted to ask you is, it is in uh, the Deborah Roberts Native Sons, Many Thousands Gone, that you have those George portraits, right? And it's the mm -hmm. first time that boys, boys enter the work, correct? Yes. And uh, it is in that solo show that you also present Pet of Consciousness, right? Which is the sculptural work with yeah. directly uh, related to George's story, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so... I think I would love for you to, yeah, talk a little bit about um, your, uh, that in the upcoming contemporary show, you, you're going to, you are in the midst of preparing uh, interactive sound, text, video, sculpture work. Right. So as you're saying, you know, taking the risk, expanding out of and uh, embracing new languages, I think uh, it, I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Right. Well, I'm nervous about it. Um, I remember when I did a show um, uh, at Art Palace in, um, uh, in Houston, and um, I put in a, a little sculpture piece. It was my first attempt, and I got a review in Glass Tire. <laughs> and I remember the, um, the, the writer saying, you know, I really love the show, but I don't know what she was doing with that sculpture thing. And so it was like, okay, I was, I was, I thought I was in my own lane. And then I said, well, maybe I, I, I need to pull back into my own lane a little bit more. So it was, it's, it's been about five years uh, before I started the, the, uh, the, the consciousness piece. Uh, for Val um projects in Los Angeles. And this is a bigger undertaking because I'm asking you to participate by walking into, into this, 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 this project and to be able to exist in what I consider my body or my consciousness as a Black woman for, for about a minute. And, 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 and also on the other side, I mean, it's a two-sided um, project that you'll be able to be uh, 
to engage in a, a visual, um, let's see, a visual experience that, that we have to have, we kind of go through every day. And, and those type of classism and social, uh, social things that we have to endure. Uh, and you have to reconcile yourself while you're in there, or you can just say, well, I don't know what they're ever thinking, this doesn't make any sense or whatever, but you know, life is chance. You have to take chances. And uh, there are so many pathways, as you and I know, to talk about blackness and the black experience and, and the, you know, this black existence. And it's not just one way. It's so many other ways to talk about that. We and humans are a complex being. And so what I'm trying to do in my work, whether it be the text, collage, and now this installation part, is to create new pathways to talk about that. You know, I could just, you know, talk about hair and, and get a bunch of hair and stick it on a, on a clean piece of canvas and say, hair, this is talking about hair. But, you know, I wanted to, I want, as an artist, I want to be able to, to walk, a, you know, a different path. To, to talk about that, be a part of the dialogue, but have my own little couple of lines, you know, in, in, the, in the paragraph, you know, how a creative paragraph, you know, you know, leave, leave a trail for someone else to say, well, okay, Deborah started this, but you know, she faltered or whatever. And I'm going to take that up because I can see something different if I move and shift this work and I move it this way. So sometimes you can, you can it, it may not be for successful for you, but you can also be the, the seed for someone else to grow. Maybe they need to grow that instead of you. So you need to put it out there and not be afraid. And that's what I'm doing. I don't know. And, you know, I'm doing it. We'll see what happens. But, um, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure of two things in the show. I'm sure the collage and the text. But, you know, the installation is, is a chance. And... I'm hoping this and praying that it works, you know, um, just for me, you know, not for anyone else, you know. I think, it, I mean, you have been following that path from the beginning and it has done you well, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, I am very excited to experience all of it, including the installation. And uh, I think, you know, there is, uh, uh, I always think about language in your work. I mean, beyond the, the actual text pieces with the names, even just your titling, right? The titles you come up with for your works, for the collages. And there's so much that is said just in the language that you use, you know, beyond the, the medium language, right? Uh, and uh, I've been thinking a lot about the title for your upcoming show, you know, for your first museum show in Texas, uh, your second museum show after the Spelman College Museum, uh, The Evolution and Mimi. So we go from The Evolution, Deborah Roberts, The Evolution and Mimi, like we said, which is a mid-career retrospective. You actually have, it begins with the figurative painting that you started doing in your career and mm -hmm. comes all the way up to uh, your signature medium, the collages, right? And you know, that's 2018, right? And mm -hmm. now, 2021, Deborah Roberts, I'm. And it's not I am, it's I'm, with just the powerful uh, <laughs> apostrophe, which, you know, you've been mentioning Toni Morrison over and over. <laughs> you right. know, she talks um, about how amazing the apostrophe is, you know, that it can be... Uh, for possession, and yet it could be for contraction about action and a, a verb. Uh, yeah, there is just a distillation of very clear, direct, economical expression in that title. I'm. I'm. So, um, yeah, I think I, I, you know, this could just, uh, just for you to, and I'm realizing, of course, we're time is coming up for questions, you know, I don't know. I thought that might just help us for you maybe just talk about like just coming from that uh, evolution of me, me to I'm, you know, just to talk about just uh, right. evolution. You could uh, just yourself, the work, or you can even talk about in the sense of, you know, I really had wanted to ask you about 
you being an Austinite, choosing to be in Austin, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> however you want to frame that, you know, right. to just uh, talk to us a little. Yeah, bit. well, I guess the I'm, the I'm is, you know, this is who I am, you know, or that exists in the work. Like, you know, um, I was saying someone earlier this week is that when I was doing one of the, the, the works, the title came right out. This is, this is who I am. And it, uh, this is this kid. It just came right out. It normally doesn't happen. So all the work that I started doing, and I, I kept telling people, the show comes together, not in the first maybe five, six works you do. It comes together in the middle and the end. That's when it starts to tie together. And the work starts, this is the show. And, and titles like that, this is who I am, um, fighting the isms and all those type of things, you know, started to come through the work. And uh, I was, it's, it's explaining exactly how eloquent you just said, I'm not what you think. I am, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm a multiple person, I'm multiple of, of, of existence in this world. So, so you're gonna hopefully see that in the work, and w even with the text, the text is um, uh, what is it? Um, La Condra is a noun. You know, she is more. I'm more. I'm places. I'm, I, I, I'm things. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm a lot. You know, so you're gonna see that hopefully in the work. Um, and, you know, being from Austin, you know, I mean, it came with a lot of baggage staying here. And uh, uh, I remember when I had to make the choice whether to move or stay. And I, I, I went to uh, New York City to see some shows and I sat down with Amy Sherrill. I've been trying to get Amy Sherrill to move to Austin. Uh, <laughs> she's not coming. Uh, but um, we talked about it and I had everything I needed in the world. And I remember at the Carver Museum when I did the show right after graduate school, a group show, and I said, I concede Austin. I had to finally mentally concede Austin because it wasn't happening for me. Uh, and I knew that. And I said, I concede Austin. I want the world. And I said it out loud in a group of people at a, at a panel discussion. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew it had to mean, mean something more. And not within two years, I was in New York having this show. So, and, and just everything took off after that. And now I, 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 have, I have the world's attention, not the whole world, of course. I'm not, I don't have a big old fat ego like that. But I'm just saying that I, I, I London, I mean, I get, I get Paris, I get so many people from all over contacting me about my practice now. So I have made a, a, a global, you know, nudge, you know, a pinprick, a very little sand drop, but it's, it's more than I had before. So I can live in Austin as long as I can travel out of it and, and do what I need to do because I'm not depending on Austin for my survival, for my recognition, for my, my that away girl, you know, that I needed to be successful. So staying here is, uh, uh, is, is important. My family's here. Uh, my friends are here. Um, you know, me, you, Tammy, and Christina, the, the sisterhood group, you know, the Wakanda girls. Um, so I need that. I need to be able to, to, to have that type of dialogue and to exist in this community. I um, mean, it, it's not diverse enough. Uh, when we talk about uh, the art world is not not about Austin. It's about you know nationally, globally. You know, um, there's only so much you can achieve here in Austin once you've done all the the, the four or five uh, places, the shows, and then you have to start thinking regionally, and then you know outside of that. And so, so the dialogue has to be about a bigger issue. Uh, in the art world with me. And I, I do have, I do miss some of my contempt. Amy told me that, you know, the only thing that's that's really negative about living in Austin is if you can't call Simone Lee up, you can't call, you know, you know, several different um, artists, female artists that live in New York City, you know, Jordan Castillo, all these people say, hey, let's go to lunch. 
and then just talk about the art world in a bigger context because we're in a space where so many people want the work. I mean, so many people are doing a very dishonest things to get the work. Then, then you have like, you know, dealers and the auctions and all these things that people who are actually having these things happen to them is it's great to, you know, physically sit in front of them and talk about it. So you don't seem as if you're complaining. Um, I have to really watch that because I don't want to think I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, everything has happened for me, but it's, it's extremely hard at times. And uh, you, uh, you need someone else who's going through that to understand that um, you're not complaining. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's just every day. I mean, every day, every day, every day. I mean, you know, every day is something different and more people and more responsibilities and more, um, I mean, I'm not a machine. I cannot produce um, I cannot produce a hundred works a week in order to, 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 to meet up with all the people who want the work. Uh, I can only do so much. And, uh, and be, but because I was so poor three years ago, I want to do a hundred works a week. So, so that I don't have to experience that again. Um, you know, so, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's different. I'm, if I, that's, four or five museums that if I can have my work collected in those museums, I would be extremely happy. Um, and what are those museums? Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we have work holding for MoMA. We haven't heard back from them. Um, there is the Tate Modern, um, which the Guggenheim, I would love the Met, um, mostly in the New York gallery, that got museums, I guess. Um, um, where is it? It's one other way. I mean, I mean, you know, my goal was I was a student museum in Harlem. You know, that was my thing. Uh, the Whitney Museum, because, well, you know, I was told I wasn't going to be in there. And so I am in that. Uh, um, you know, uh, it, it's just been great. The Brooklyn Museum, I love the Brooklyn Museum. I mean, I walk in there, I have lifetime memberships. I don't like, never arrive. It's like, go, go on in. Um, I love it. You know, that part is great. Um, I always say that I want people to experience this. I mean, I want more artists to experience this because I think sometimes we're romantic about the, what the art world really is. And while it is a extremely a large amount of money and stuff, it is a lot of other stuff. You know, um, as Amy said, more money, more problems, but there is some beautiful things that happen. Uh, you know, when uh, you get to talk to, uh, let's see, uh, let's see I, I, I'm going to say this anyway, because it's kind of me, but, you know, Samuel Jackson, <laughs> you know, I want, I want Samuel Jackson to call me a motherfucker, and it's so weird, because he said it so well, I mean, I, I want to ask him, will you call me, he's like, and my sister said, he's going to say, what type of motherfucker want to be called motherfucker, <laughs> but I mean, Samuel Jackson, we're going to talk to him, you know, I'm never going to get, to, once he gets his work, I'm never talking to him again, so it's so funny, you know, it's just, uh, those things, I never thought that people would be, you know, famous people would be looking at my work, you know, and wanting it the way they do. And it's great, you know. Well, I, you know, I, we're going to have to go to questions soon, but uh, I am so glad that you chose to stay here. You could easily have gone somewhere. Actually, everything says you should go somewhere. Right. You should go to the official centers of the art world. But, you know, I think you're, you being here in person and not an abstract idea make something that's supposed to be fiction real kind of what you do in your work in the sense that yeah. these uh, girls these lives they're not fiction they're real yeah. you know yeah. and uh, uh, uh overwhelming officialized history of this country uh likes to make fiction out of history and then make a uh, uh, history fiction. So I think it's great. You're real. You're here. We are so glad. I'm personally very glad. Um, so I think probably now would be a good time to allow some other people to ask you questions. I have so many more things we could talk about, but you know, I know. Minutes, the studio there's no time. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I know. I know. Uh, so let's see, you know, I'm kind of like a grandma with the Zoom. I'm going to try <laughs> to figure out if 
There is uh, some questions here. So as Shea said in the beginning, uh, if you have any questions, if you would put them in the chat, I can read them out and then uh, Deb can respond. So let me see here. Um, oh, okay, wonderful. There is a question here that says, um, hi Deb, would you like to speak at all about your thoughts behind the mural going up on the exterior of the contemporary 7th okay. Street wall and uh, as this is right around the corner and it's, yeah. So it's a question from Heather Pisanti and she says the contemporary is very excited about it. Right, well, um, you know, I'm gonna, on the outside wall, I'm gonna do a mural of five boys. You know, I'm not gonna put any girls on here because this idea of little boys being, um, their lives changing in third grade, if you don't have the right type of uh, teacher that tends to change, who I think you're supposed to be. And it's been happening from first kindergarten to third grade. So you're eight, nine years old, and you're told that you're, you know, aggressive, whatever. So I have a beautiful little boy who is gonna be on the wall and he's gonna be jumping from, you know, the different, the pit, kind of like the little holes, the little stair steps, and he's gonna be flying and he's gonna be just free. You know, I think about Jameer Rice when people, killed him when those cops killed him and thought that he was a, a grown-up guy who was just a little boy so in this and this this mural you're gonna see this kid with he's gonna have some man hands but he's definitely gonna be a little boy with multiple faces and he's gonna be free and i really like the idea of him moving around uh like this on the wall he's up and down and then just off you know, it's going to be great. Just being free kid, being on a pedestal that you don't get to see often, being hoisted up for the world to, to look up to. You know how many Black kids you look up to? So you have to look up to see him, which is going to be great. Um, so uh, that's coming up, uh, going up in September. So uh, yeah, I really can't wait to see this. I mean, I've been privileged to be able to see some of the mock-ups and uh, yeah, incredible, uh, beautiful gift to Austin. Um, let me see here. Another question says, uh, I get this one is related to the wall itself. Mm -hmm. It says, what will be the process of making the mural on the wall? Okay, well, you know me, I ain't getting up on no scaffolding doing another and then that pain. That ain't gonna happen. So the process is, is that I, I collaged uh, six images on uh, my regular collaging, you know, like I would do. We shot them. Uh, we're gonna print out a huge eight foot image. You know, it's gonna get cut out and then we're gonna affix it to the wall. It's just gonna be like a billboard, like you would do a billboard uh, image. So it can take all the elements, the rain, the Texas heat, the graffiti, I'm sure it's gonna write on him. Uh, you know, it can just take a lot of things. And so he's gonna be huge. So, uh, and it's not permanent. Um, you're gonna be able to pull, take him down. Um, but, you know, it's probably destroyed in that taking down, but I have all, all the, um, the, the, the collages that I did. So we actually still have the artwork. So it would be great. But the process, yeah, it's going to be a digitized printing of it that uh, actually can be affixed to the wall. So I don't have to be, uh, the days of scaffolding are over, you know, you know, the, the digital media is just great. And, you know, from the samples we got, it looks really, it's going to look just exactly like one of my collages. It's going to be perfect. Wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question here, and it was a question that I wanted to get into as well, but we didn't get a chance, which is, uh, you know, like literature is so central to your work, just within the work it shows up, you know, mm -hmm. uh, allusions in your titles or mm -hmm. references, as well as, you know, being your studio mate, I realized you're actually listening to books as you're working. So mm -hmm. someone asked, I know you have the best book collection would you please tell us what you're looking at or reading these days? Well, um, I don't know. I, you know, I was, you know, I, I love Toni Morrison and she, she's amazing. I've, you know, listened and read all of her books, Colton Whitehead, Nickel Boys. Um, I finished that, um, 
early in the quarantine. Um, anything James Baldwin. Although I was listening to um, um, G Giovanni's room from uh, James Baldwin, I had to stop for some odd reason. It was getting to a point where I just, you know, because of Corona, I could, I could hear, have all that angst in my life. So I had to put him down. Um, right now, I mean, I would love to tell you guys I'm really into uh, reading um, uh, books that really inspire me, but I'm reading um, mysteries. You know, I love mysteries. Um, um, Samantha Irby's book, um, I just, I, I posted it on Facebook and I can't think of the title, but it's so funny. And what's hap, helped me sleep at night, if I can look this, listen or read something that is really funny and take all the stress away, I sleep so much better. So um, I'm, I'm look, reading that book. Um, God, uh, man. I mean, I, I love Cornel West. You know, I, I read him very often. I, I just a couple of his essays. I mean, his essay um, on Horace Pittman is amazing. You, I mean, I tell people all the time, if you want to understand why black artists do what they do, read that essay. Uh, then you want to understand about black bodies and the Western idea of why black men are sometimes often attacked. Read, read the reader uh, with Cornel West on black sexuality. Uh, that was key to me. It was key to changing everything. Uh, that essay and the Horace Pippen essay that's in that book uh, were like, you know, that was the, um, the, the, the vital part that was missing in my work was literature. And um, it was right, it was always in front of me. I didn't know that was the key. And so once I inserted that into the door of knowledge, <laughs> it opened up the world for me, which was great, you know? So um, yeah, literature is very important in my work. Um, this is a great question. I think it kind of circles back, but you know, the I Am show is coming up next year. So um, uh, this is a question directly related to it. It says, uh, Deborah, do you find that scale, large scale works, uh, thinking about the mural too, uh, can impact whether your work, conscious activism and art can transform subtle messages to in your face messages in black art. And she says that she's drawing this question from uh, Kerry Jones Marshall's, uh, what he said about grand scale work. I guess like, how do you think scale affects the, communication ability of the work. Right, well, it becomes heroic. When you do large, large, big, large images of black bodies, they tend, like I said, you tend to have to look up. They become heroic. They become bigger than life and, and, and they demand attention. Small scale, I mean, you know, looking at stuff, I like small scale work too, because it draws you in, because you have to get close in order to see it. But, you know, if, you're doing like one of the little boys, I mean, one of the best ones, I think, you know, of course there's some weak ones, there's some good ones, but <laughs> the best one, the boy, uh, uh, you know, his hand, you can't see it, it goes off the board. You don't know what he's doing. So it leaves it up to the imagination, but it's just, he, his hand is like balled up and he's like, you know, you don't know what he's doing. He could be carrying a sign, he could be doing everything. It just leaves the imagination. You know, you can figure out what's happening in the work. Um, that's one of the strongest works, you know, that's going to be on the wall. And, um, you know, I, 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 yeah, I think large scale helps. I mean, um, we'll see, you know, it's the first time that I've ever done something like this and we'll see how it holds up. Um, I mean, but there's change in scale also. I mean, that has happened in the, in the collages too. Right? Oh yeah. 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 Sure. Uh, that's something that I want people to come and see because that happened too. Yeah. Um, that I was surprised by. And, and, you know, you have to come to the show and see that. But yeah, something happened in the collages of a corona. Yeah, it's weird what happened. Uh, let's see here. This is a, kind of a very uh, grounded question. Uh, it's open-ended too, so, but uh, more as an advice. What suggestions do you have for making art your profession? Uh, what, what, um, 
oh, how do you make art your profession? Mm-hmm. You just do it. You do it. I mean, you're going to have food insecurities. You're going to have, probably have uh, housing insecurities. You're going to have everything that, um, that exists out there. But is this, if this is what meant for you to do, you're going to find a way to do it. And you're going to find a way to survive it. And one of the things that I've always said about my practice is I've always been earnest with the work. I've always, you know, the work get the big room. I always got the small room. The work, you know, got most of the money to buy materials. Um, I make cold calls. I don't care what people, I know Jerry Saul said don't make cold calls. I make cold calls to people. I ask people to do Skype uh, studio visits with me. I don't bombard them with 24 works. You know that if you ask someone to see your work, you have to have uh, up to eight images. You cannot just bombard people with thousands of works. They can't do it. But I know a lot of artists, if you ask them for 15 minutes, they will give you 15 minutes. You tell them, I don't want, you're gonna ask curators, different types of curators. You don't ask a curator who's, who's, who's about to install a big show. She doesn't have time for that. But if you take, I'm not interested in the show. I'm, at, I'm interested in you looking at the aesthetics of my work and tell me what you think. I've got curators who've given me those 15 minutes early in my career, mid-career, and now, even though I'm considered an ingenue in the art world, I don't know what that's about, but, uh, um, you know, I, I do all that stuff. I, um, I, um, I take chances. I need energy in order to keep this thing going. Uh, sometimes people can become energy for you if you get a yes. A lot of no's tend to take, kind of drown you out. Uh, but we all know that there are people who will help us if we ask. Uh, I know there are artists who probably have assistants, so you probably can't get them. You can't like email Jeff Coons and think he's gonna respond. That's not, you know, really cool. But I mean, he should respond, but he won't. But um, but you can figure out ways and um, of, of getting people to look at your work. One thing, one tool in particular, I don't know what time we have, is um, Instagram. There is five hashtags you must be using in your Instagram. One of them is art. One of them is contemporary art. One of them is painting, drawing, mixed media. All the museums, all curators, not all, but most curators, when they, they use hashtags, they might use contemporary art, they may use art, all those things is an algorithm that's in Instagram that you want to be put on those pages so that people can see your work. Uh, I use those things all the time. Um, Larry, uh, my friend in New York City, when he saw my show, my work at Volta, he, hit, he put me up on Instagram and said, hey, people, y'all need to come and see this work. I mean, it was the beginning. Instagram has been such a key for me. Um, uh, when, when galleries, people look at Instagram pages, but you can't have your pages with your dog and your cat eating ice cream and, and, <laughs> and your children crawling. I mean, all of those things, you have to have an art page with your work, your struggle, what you're going through, what you're thinking about, so that people don't have to wade through all the other stuff to see your work. And you have to post that stuff. You have to get it out. Um, and, and, and just let and take chances. You have to take chances. You're going to get a, a, lot, a lot of no's, but at the end of the day, you still have your birthday. I mean, you, you know, you can always celebrate your birthday. They can't take that away from you. They can't take away things. So you have to say in, in, in the whole spectrum, I'm going to pursue people. I mean, I, I, I remember, you know, emailing Alexandra Grant in LA and asking her when I did my text piece and she did a show at Laura Reynolds Gallery. I didn't know her. I, I emailed and asked her, can I have 15 minutes? I, I'm doing a new tech, a body of text work. It's very new for me. Um, can't you just look at it? It's totally different from your work and I don't want anything. I just want what you think. And I sent her prior to our meeting, I sent her five images of my text work. So when she came on board, she already had the references. I wasn't scrambling, trying to figure things out. She had it, what the titles, the sizes, everything. And we were able to have a dialogue that lasted one hour when I only asked for 15 minutes. So things like that. I mean, people are willing to do it. 
Um, you know, last time in a um, in a live broadcast, I said I could do them. I don't want to do them. I'm not going to say that, but if you catch me on the right day, I can do them. But uh, um, right now, I just need a break. So, <laughs> you know, just need a break. That's that's really great, and I think that that was excellent, useful advice. And I'm just seeing just people in the chat also saying thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to tag on to that, I think that, you know, this moment, this kind of uh, uh, distraction, lower distraction, contemplative, giant pause of a moment has also kind of opened up a window where you might get unexpected responses if you reach out to people. You know what right. I mean? I don't know right. if it's just, uh, there's just a certain generosity that has opened up in this time that i have found you know right, some, right. Yeah, it is. which is so wonderful you right. know right um, and right if, just, you, yeah. if you find some artist who is doing work that's that's similar but not so much like yours i mean everybody can talk about aesthetics we all can talk about aesthetics and, you know even if it's something i don't really quite understand i can tell you what i'm feeling about it when i see it you know and also too when you're looking for a gallery and you do butterflies, don't to go to a gallery that do abstract bulls or something like that. That's not the gallery for you. You have to find artists who do the similar work than you. Go online, check out their resume, look at all the galleries they've shown at, and then pursue those galleries if they're still open. That's the key, I mean, to get shows and everything, group shows. I mean, I don't put down coffee sh shops, or libraries, banks, I did them all. I did every day. Um, to try to get uh, my work out. I did the Pecan Street Festival for a, a number of years. I mean, um, you know, you know, you just have to do what you have to do in order to, to move the stuff forward. Um, you know, I, I do think that you should definitely uh, reach out to people. I think that's right now everybody's, you know, kind of trapped inside, you know? Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you mm -hmm. so much, Deb. I don't know now if, since we can't, I can only see you. If, if I know, I don't know what time. They're going to pop up, up, you know. Um, I know, Shay might have to come in here and tell us. I know. <laughs> Shay, do you come on now? Yeah, yeah. tell her what's happening. Yeah. Oh, I hear his voice. I hear that bassy voice. Yeah. yeah. We, we are past time. I think we could all listen to y'all talk for hours and hours. Wonderful, powerful, and so inspirational. Thank you both. Um, there's lots more questions, but it is time for us to all go eat lunch and take care of ourselves. Um, but once again, thank you both so, so very much. That was, that was a wonderful conversation. And it's no surprise that we had over 100 people listening in. Um, thank you. And everyone, join us next week. We have uh, the wonderful Michelle Mayer, uh, same time, same place. So once again, Betty, Deborah, thank you so much. Y'all have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank All right. you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. This is my Bye, dad. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got to get my spot time that. because y'all yeah. have to live well and prosper, you know. Right. <laughs> All right. I like All right, that. everybody. Uh, be well. Ciao, ciao, yeah. ciao. Ciao, everybody.